otherwise known as Mission Dharma. And welcome to the rest of you to our weekly reminder of, of the things we tend to forget and then experience, hopefully experience the blessings of remembering together and supporting each other with what's really needed in this world and this time. And I think what is most needed, a good place to start, is to hear each other's voices, to hear a collective. And I invite you before we even sit tonight to say good evening to each other, unmute, say where you're calling in from, just feel the, the world come together a little bit in, a, in this virtual sangha. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Hello. 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 Nice to Hello. see you. Hello. Uh, Hi from Fish Creek, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, yay. Yep. Hi <laughs> from Victoria, Canada. Yay, Victoria. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ah. Well, welcome to New Mexicans. <laughs> Santa Barbara here. Hey. Hi, Allie. Hey, Mary. Holly <laughs> Ray's here. Hi, Allie. <laughs> yeah. And there's Dan at Nancy Taylor's house. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I logged on with the wrong idea. <laughs> Problem. Say hello to Nancy if you talk to her. Oh, I will. <laughs> Great. Anyway, glad to see all of you and sit with you and hopefully apply to ourselves what the world needs. And I'll probably run on about a little bit, apply to ourselves kindness, compassion, mercy. Tonight. And I think the best way to begin the process of applying kindness, mercy is to, to whatever extent we're able to, to at least for this time to forget the past. It's just a memory at this point. And to forget the future, it's just an, another idea. And maybe even to forget the idea of present, that's another idea, but, but mostly just focus on what's here, on reality. And I don't think there's too many things more kind and compassionate than, than experiencing yourself directly, unfiltered by memory or plans. So give yourself that gift of simple presence be in the presence of your own kind attention and let the fact that you are aware gladden your heart with you this is as suzuki roshi describes this is the ultimate fact that you're aware here you want to rely on what's ultimately true and just let yourself bathe in that sense of aware presence. When I think of aware presence, I think of the combination of feeling a sense of aliveness, a feeling of your body here, uh, mingling, mixed with that feeling of being aware, that sense or that knowledge of being aware. Bringing awareness together with this vitality of being present, this, this felt sense of presence. This is a this is a gift. This is a gift of kindness to yourself, and it shouldn't be a gift that we need, but we are so habitually disembodied, habitually lost in 
um, our worries or our memories that our mind and body needs this form of compassion uh, in the form of just kind attention. So let your eyes close softly. And let your sense of being aware right now, that ultimate fact, let it be sensed as though it was a, uh, we can call it a space of awareness, but really sense it as a space of kindness, imbued with kindness. So a kind and soft attention to this sitting body. And the kindest attention will allow you to allow the body to come become so close that the idea of it melts away and there's just the feeling of sensation. So close that no dividing line between awareness, this field of kind attention, no dividing line between awareness and body. It's just this. And just notice when the attention is close to these sensations, close to the feeling of the body breathing, close to the sounds that are heard close to whatever is here. And the attention is really close to here. Something in us begins to let go, to let ourselves be. Because awareness is, is completely accepting and allowing of whatever it is that's felt here. It has no agenda other than to know and embrace what's here. As they say in the Zen tradition to, with their vow to choose what's here. So if you feel this sense of intimacy with what's here, this awareness, the felt experience. Feel free to enjoy this experience of settling, of stilling, of the seclusion that is sometimes hard to find in the busyness of our lives. secluded in the body sensations, secluded in the rhythms of the breath, just this breath, just this moment. Letting the breath and physical sensations empty our mind of past and future. We fill our mind with what's here. And then staying here, supported by the anchor of the body and breath, staying here as long as it lasts. Without doing too much work, without straining or struggling, just being lovingly aware, acceptingly aware. Notice how awareness is clear and all embracing. And how natural it is to be aware. This is not just a means of awakening. This is awakening itself. So be aware. Be kind. Stay here as long as it lasts.
I say this because inevitably you will become lost in thought. At some point you will, there will be a reawakening, a re-arising of mindfulness. And so that moment of awakening is that opportunity to reconnect with this simple fact of being aware, embodied, and have awareness imbued with kindness, just this moment. Each time you reconnect with the simple fact of aware embodiment, you reconnect in the same gentle way you would put a puppy back on paper when you're trying to train it. Gentle, kind, soothing attention. Just this.
sensing your mind and body bathing in a field of loving attention, of acceptance. And even though this might be a sense of imagination, imagining all of our kindness and attention is one giant field of loving awareness. It's bathing in this field, this limitless field of, of love, of attention. Bathing in a field of acceptance. Caring. Breath by breath. Feeling by feeling, thought by thought, everything equal in that light of loving awareness. Be aware. Awareness does not strain, awareness does not struggle, it just knows. So if there's strain or struggle, know this as a state of mind. Accept this presently, but presently arising, but changing mental state. No, strain is like this, struggles like this. Sadness is like this. Just know whatever is true right now without doing anything about that experience or undoing it. Bringing that quality of choiceless love Just this moment. Just what's predominant now. Just this breath.
A royal pleasure sitting with you tonight. Thanks for your practice. And through this medium, I felt you. Your sincerity, your at least interest in being aware and hopefully interested in being kind. And a little bit like last week, I, I felt compelled at the end of the sitting to, to share the kinds of thoughts that I had during the sitting. Um, you may not be interested, but, <laughs> but it feels, um, feels like what we do here is we open to what's true and and when it comes to our speech, we try to say what's true and hopefully what's useful and hopefully what's timely and hopefully for the benefit. So I'm hoping some of my stray thoughts um, fit that definition of wise speech, but who knows, I'm, something may slip out and so I will forgive myself in advance. But anyway, I was thinking the image came to my mind during the sitting because I had dropped in the theme of kindness and mercy and compassion, forgiveness. The image came to mind of, of a fellow who may, many of you may have read, a fellow named, uh, I think his name is David Roach. And he was born with a physical uh, disfigurement or physical difference. And he went through a lot in his life, ridicule, non-acceptance, et cetera. And he discovered over the course of his life uh, a relationship of kindness to himself. And one of the ways that he realized that he was unkind, unmerciful, was the, what he saw as a systemic, as a collective uh, tendency toward perfectionism that can easily be transposed onto the Dharma. And we can end up being really ambitious excessively ambitious Dharma students and actually creating internal pressure and tension. And so much so that we can be unkind to ourselves about our practice, how we're, how we're, how we're practicing, what's coming up in our practice. But he ultimately wrote a, a, a beautiful book that I recommend. And I haven't looked at it in years, but it really stuck, stayed with me. And it was a book called 80% uh, Sincerity. And he started a church called the Church of 80% Sincerity. That instead of 100% sincerity, instead of 100% perfect, instead of 100% everything, that almost impossible demand that we make on ourselves, even how we should be able to manage uh, the pandemic and all the difficulties of our life that 100% is just not realistic. And it's not kind, it's not compassionate. So he started this church of 80% sincerity. And so his image came to my mind. And I, I realized that that's a little bit what all of us are in need of right now. Uh, in this world of what 
many commentators have recognized as uh, excessive idealism. That, that many of us, when we see a Buddha statue, we think we need to look like that Buddha statue. I just, and the reason I thought of a Buddha statue is I, I just uh, did a favor for someone and on the last retreat that I led at Spirit Rock, someone had seen a Buddha Rupa, a Buddha image, a Buddha statue that they had really enjoyed on a previous retreat and, and they couldn't get it out of their mind and it's a really good person. And so one thing led to another and I, I grabbed that Buddha Rupa before I left Spirit Rock and, and sent it off to them. And, and it was an exquisite Buddha, just so, be so beautiful that greed arose. I wanted to keep it for myself. <laughs> But, I, but seeing such a beautiful Buddha image made me realize um, that um, about that idealism and our idealism about practice. And, and I think that the, I think a more compassionate way of practicing is 80%. <laughs> the church of joining not only the Sangha, but the church of 80% sincerity. And that really leads, hopefully, some little segue into the thoughts I gen generally had before we started sitting tonight. Well, I'll tell you one more thing about what came up during the sitting. Is I was talking about, about being, um, letting your body and mind bathe in a field of loving kindness, a field of acceptance, a field of mercy, which is really the quality, the, the face of mindfulness is non-judgmentalness, is, is acceptance, is, is kindness. Some would say, in fact, I have this beautiful quote about awareness from Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, where he says, true awareness, being aware, it's a state of, of noticing, without the least attempt to do anything about the event being noticed. Thoughts, feelings, words, actions may be part of the event, but you notice all unconcerned in the full light of clarity and understanding. You understand precisely what's going on because it doesn't affect you. Awareness is not affected by what it notices. It may seem to be an attitude of cold aloofness, but it's not really so. Once you're in that quality of awareness, you'll find that you love what you see. Whatever it may be its nature, this choiceless love is the touchstone of awareness. So I was both saying to, uh, reminding us that we can um, meet ourselves with this quality of loving kindness and it may sound when I use that language that somehow this quality of loving kindness is separate from you, but you are both the love that is provided and you are that which is being loved. And so you, you are loving and loved. And there really is no dividing line between the, the lover and, and the beloved. And we can sense that when our mind and body come into the same location and we touch ourselves, 80% worth of choiceless love. <laughs> Not too excessively idealistic about it, but just for a moment. And I can't think of anything that more important for this, for our, what I call based on psychological language, this dysregula dysregulated nervous system that uh, I think most of us uh, have some measure of during this, uh, during this time that we live. Someone sent me an article today from the New York Times. Let's see, what did that article say? It now I can't find it. Where are you? 
why it's so scary to be Jewish in America today from the New York Times today. And, and I, you know, it gave, and it, the article went on to describe the, the proliferation of anti-Semitism right now and how Jewish people cannot, if they're, if they're identified with being Jewish, they cannot uh, worship freely. That most, that in fact, maybe there are no synagogues in the United States and in Europe now that, that where the front door is left open, where people can come in, they have to go through the back door and there are guards and there's security and there's, and, and it's become part of our life in so many different ways. And then this person who wrote the article, it was driving through, through another part of the country that and they saw a church and they saw the people standing in front of the church and they saw the doors wide open and it dawned on them that this is not, it's not safe for that. It's very different for, for many people. They are not safe. And, and I could, and I was thinking about this, the safety of Jews. I have a particular identification with that, but I also thought that that was just a tip of the, the tip of the, of the enormity of different uh, marginalized groups, different groups that have that are, have a chronic experience of non-safety, and so it shows up in so many ways that that's very hard on our nervous system. And then with COVID, there was a a lecture given by uh, Dan Siegel. This friend sent me this in an email that that there was in a lecture he described this acronym that the uh, the U.S. military uses for particularly tough situations, and it's called VUCA. V U C A. V U C A. You might look it up. V is for volatile. U is for uncertain. C is for complex, A is for ambiguous. And he was referring to the, to the virus, to, the, to COVID, but this can be our life in general, just in the course of, of today, actually. I met with someone who's child is um, is uh, is excessively anxious and depressed unable to uh, go to school uh, part of a long devolving process that happened with covid and just one of millions of people who's emo who has a, have a chronic emotional dysregulation from from the impact of the loss of the social fabric of that's really essential for kids. Almost more important than their education is the, is the uh, social engagement, which has been cut off for so many of them. And reconnecting has become a terrifying thing for many of them. Joyous in moments, but also really uh, not so easy. So I met with someone with terminal illness, uh, with shame, regret, um, someone who just lost their parent, uh, social isolation, uh, just innumerable ways that that um, many have lost their, their center. So what could be more important? What is the essential right now? Even, uh, I'll just say, what's really essential right now? To me, it is just unconditional compassion, unconditional love, mercy, forgiveness. I was thinking of the, the people in my life who live the most sanely, who live simply, who experience the beautiful qualities of the heart, who experience a lot of joy, 
who who practice non-harming on a regular basis. You know, their their life is really uh, emanates a certain kind of purity of action, purity of mind, a well collected, well developed mind, a purity of view, a real wise understanding. And I was thinking about the beings in my life who cross my path, who seem to represent that in some form, the, the fourth heavenly messenger. Remember the Buddha saw four heavenly messengers. They saw a person who was quite ill, saw a person who was quite old, saw a corpse. These are the, the messengers that turned him toward awakening, toward a, a deeper understanding that there was nothing that what could be clung to in this world of change. But then he saw a fourth one, it was a, in the form of a mendicant or a, a renunciate, somebody who lived very simply, who very contentedly. But then I thought about the people in my life who live simply and contentedly. And they may have a, may be in touch with a well-being that is independent of circumstances. But nevertheless, even those with the simplest life still have to, have to navigate a body that doesn't work all the time. The body that gets sick, a body that gets old, a body that hurts, a body that gets one form of disease or another, dis-ease or another. Even if you have a simple life, a loving life, still our mind, because we are not separate from the collective, we don't exist apart from the whole. We are heirs to mental patterns. We tend to, we live in a culture of mental proliferation, a culture of desire, a culture that, that, um, that breeds and supports greed to keep it going. All of that becomes part of our mind stream. This is not just, it's not just, uh, not just about how you live. This is just ends up being part of our human condition. So we have mental, can have mental distress. We can have physical distress. Even if you live a loving and simple life, even if you have the best of circumstances and you have love in your life, you experience loss. You experience, uh, you experience the, if you're empathic at all, have empathy. If you have compassion, you feel the pain of your beloved. You feel the pain of your loved ones. So no one escapes dukkha. No one escapes dukkha entirely. So everyone, everyone, no matter how much you're comparing mind, idealizes and elevates others, everyone is worthy of compassion. Because even, even the, the, the most privileged have loss in their lives, have desires and have frustrated desires. And everyone, no matter how, how good their conditions are, still have identities that are identities that are some that are functional and useful, that help us remind us of the different roles that we play. But everybody who has identities has dukkha because identities are not reliable. Identities are, um, they're just not a place that we can rest. And because human beings tend to coagulate around identities, of either with our body that's getting old, identity with time that's running out, identity with moods that are changing all the time, there is no, there is absolutely no one who does not experience the dukkha of identity. There's not anybody that from time to time does not mistake their view about themselves for the reality. 
everyone falls into a case of mistaken identity. In fact, the Buddha described how in the course of many, 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 many years of practice, in the different, what, what are sometimes described as the stages of enlightenment, that there are certain fetters of the mind, certain tendencies of mind, things that keep us really bound, the internal process that keep us bound on a wheel of dissatisfaction. And that slowly, slowly over the course of much practice, the certain fetters are uprooted, the fetter of greed, the fetter of aversion, the fetter of restlessness, the fetter of, of, um, of self, of believing in the self idea as, as real. But the last one, one of the last few to be uprooted is the mind that compares. Even the most so-called most enlightened person you know is still subject to comparison. And if, that, if a person is subject to comparison, they have a little stress in their life even though we can come to recognize and relate to the comparing mind as just another momentary state of mind, still triggers stress. Anytime one puts themselves above, below, or equal. So everybody, you know, everybody has stress. So everybody's worthy of compassion and mercy. So you have your version of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Does that seem to, does that resonate at all? Your life? The beauty, though, of all of our lives is that we can, uh, we can meet that with kindness, or we can meet it with judgment. Everybody has something that may, may be ashamed of, regret, because we were, you weren't always as enlightened as you are now. And even, and maybe that was even last week, you weren't as enlightened as you are now. But really, if you take the body of your life, everything that you've said and done, you could not find in, the, in the, the stream of consciousness that you mistakenly call you, that you think is independent or apart from the flow of life. If you really look at it deeply, if you really look at this individual that you call you, the closer you get to it, the more you see that that there is no you that exists independently from everything that caused you. This is what Thich Nhat Hanh says is the, is the purpose of our awakening is to awaken from our illusion of separateness. Why do we want to awaken to our illusion of separateness? Because the illusion of separateness makes us prone to self-blame, to self-judgment to a loss of perspective, to a narrow perspective where we don't realize that everything about us is informed by non-personal causes. That when I talk, you know, I read about that, I read that article about Jewishness, it has a particular meaning to me because I, I come from a legacy of, of Jews in the Jewish diaspora. And those who've heard me talk about this, how the the village of my grandmother was basically destroyed and she was part of during the programs. And so all that is an influence that affects in ways knowing and unknowing the ways that I experience my life that would be different than the causes and conditions that, that run through each of us. But never, even though we each have this particularity, our particularity is made up of all these non-personal elements. Came across a beautiful poem that I thought I would share with you. 
from Joy Harjo, and it's called Remember. And to me, this is a poem of compassion the, because it is the most compassionate, one of the most compassionate things we can do is remember that as, Je as Wes Nisker puts it, uh, we are not, you are not your fault. <laughs> That's his line. You are not your fault. This is from Joy Harjo. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who the moon is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of your mother's life and your mother's mother's life, her mother's and their mother's. Remember your father, he, your father is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember the wind's voice. She, the wind knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance languages that life is. Remember. So you are not your fault. And what's really needed right now is, is acceptance, is kindness. Is to treat your wounds tenderly, as Pesha Joyce Gertler says, finally on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin, my bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them one by one close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. So another flavor of this comes from Mary Oliver, who says, you don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I'll tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely the, world's off, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. The quality of acceptance of just choosing what's here, choosing what you are in this moment not some packaged, idealized image. This is one of the big causes of stress for the young people. There's all the, the TikTok body image stuff. There's just so much that's, that is, um, just doesn't allow 
entrains people not to accept themselves as they are. So whatever your mind, whatever your body is, can you forgive yourself right now? Can you apply that self-compassion? So it's both, it's both compassionate toward everyone. No one is their fault, but it's compassion toward ourselves. Can we say to ourselves in the teachings of the of self, the burgeoning teachings of self-compassion, the heart of it is, um, is reflecting. It is, it's okay that I'm not perfect. <laughs> it's okay that I'm not perfect. It's okay that I make mistakes. It's okay that I'm still learning, that I'm a learner. I forgive myself. I forgive myself. And I just have a few more things. Because this, what's needed so much is, is our loving kindness, our compassion. And I just love the, the Rumi poem where he says, isn't it true that everyone you see, you say to them, love me, love me. Of course, you don't say this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this, the great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one with a full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in this world is longing to hear, is dying to hear. A, can we really be compassionate even toward people we disagree with? Can we see that people can't help themselves based on all of their conditioning? For, that everyone is forgivable. Even the ones we think are unredeemable. That shouldn't be such a novel idea in, in this world of, but we live in a world of polarization. I just, to, I wanted to create a little time for comments or questions, but I, I came across today, and especially in, in relationship to MLK's birthday uh, yesterday, or the um, celebration of MLK Day, the words from James Lawson of the, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was, which was really formed out of, with, by members of the Southern um, Christian Leadership Conference with, you know, basically led by MLK. And someone had sent me uh, James Lawson's words, where he said, we, we, we affirm the philosophical or religious ideal of nonviolence as the foundation of our purpose, the manner of our action, nonviolence as it grows from Judeo-Christian tradition seeks a social order of justice permeated by love. Through nonviolence, courage displaces fear. Love transforms hate. Acceptance dissipates prejudice. Peace dominates war. Faith reconciles doubt. Mutual regard cancels enmity. Justice overthrows injustice. The redemptive community supersedes systems of gross social immorality. Love is the central motif of nonviolence. Such love goes to the extreme. It remains loving and forgiving even in the midst of hostility. Boy, isn't that a message we need to hear? This was from 1960 when this was founded. And the person who sent me this and sent along with it the words of the Buddha from the Samyutta Nikaya said, therefore, you should train yourself thus. We will develop and cultivate the liberation of mind by love. Make it our vehicle, make it our basis, stabilize it, steady and consolidate it, exercise ourselves in it and fully perfect it at least 
80%. No, I'm just kidding. This, thus should you train yourselves. Liberation of the mind through love. So I'll end finally with the Metta Sutta. The heart, some would say the heart of the Buddha's teaching and awakening. This is what should be done by those who are skilled in goodness, who know the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm, wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, and that's for all of us, omitting, definitely not omitting ourselves. Omitting none. The great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies, downward to the depths, outward and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. 80%. Sorry, I had to editorialize. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from the dependency on sense desires, is not born again into the cycle of suffering. And may we all grow in love. And its, and its expression of compassion when it meets the, the pain, meets the, the ambiguity, meets the uncertainty, meets all the different things of our own lives, of, the, of our world. Um, may our hearts grow in this and may, may our lives be a benefit and may any of the fruits of our practice tonight, uh, if there are any, any goodness that's arisen from our being together, let that also be shared and let it be the cause of much more compassion, uh, unconditional compassion. Uh, thanks for listening. We have a couple minutes for any comments if you like. You can use the raised hand function. And then we'll just, if you're so inclined, any quick questions. Yeah. Just wait a moment. If there's none, we'll just bid each other good night. Mary, please unmute. Yeah, sorry. Just a quick thing. Um, there was um, uh, just some meme or something. I don't even remember what it was, but it really spoke to me. And it, 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 it just a few lines, but a lot of what you were talking about today that I've kept in my mind through the pandemic. And it says, do you know who's having a hard time? Everyone. So just be kind. Very nice. Very nice. You said in a few words what took me 40 minutes to say. But you said it so beautifully and eloquently. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mary. But this is easier to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. If you put it Thank in the chat you. box, other people can take it with them. Oh, okay. 
I will. Feel Thank free. you. Anyone else before we sign off? Okay. You know who's having a hard time? Everyone. Let's be kind. So please feel free to unmute and say good night to each other. Good night. Thank you, Howard. Good night. Thank you, Howard.